Let's start with a little humor this morning. Teacher gave her class of second graders a lesson on the magnet and what it does. The next day, on a written test, she included the question. My full name has six letters. The first one is M. I pick things up. What am I? When the test papers were turned in, the teacher was astonished that almost 50% of the class said the word mother. Another teacher one. Teacher asked little boy the question, you suppose your mom make an apple pie and there were seven of you, your parents and five children. What part of the pie do you get? The boy goes, a sixth. Teacher said, I'm afraid you don't understand fractions. The teacher said, remember, there's seven of you. Yes, teacher, the little boy said, but you don't know my mother. My mom wouldn't want any. <laughs> the love of a mom is staggering. But you know, the love that we see exhibited in moms should be the same love that you and I exhibit on our daily basis. Turn with me, would you, to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at two parallel passages today. And we're going to talk about love. It says in, verse, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1, I'm reading out of the Amplified. If I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love, that reasoned in intentional spiritual devotion as such, as inspired by God's love for and in us all, I'm only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, that is the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose of God, understanding all the secret truths and the mysteries and possessing all knowledge, and I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not God's love in me, I am nothing but a useless body. We're going to look at the story of Exodus today. Exodus chapter 1, so if you want to stick your finger in there. We'll look at what lengths this love exhibited to this mom, how she lived her life, and how we should parallel our lives on how she lived her life. Let's pray. Father, as we unpack this today, we get into your word. Encourage our hearts that we might also live out our faith in this way. Thank you for moms. Thank you, Father, for giving us living examples in our own church body of the devotion and love that moms exhibit because they exhibit love better than any person on earth. I cry out to you this day that we would become better people because of these stories that we would learn to possess and to live out your love in this way. Bless now your sons. Amen. In Exodus chapter 1, we're going to look in verse 22, and then we're going to read through on into Exodus chapter 2. It says in chapter 1 of Exodus, verse 22, Then Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the river Nile, but every daughter you shall allow to live. Now, Armin, a man of the house of Levi, the priestly tribe, went and took his wife, Jobetta, the daughter of a Levi. And the woman became pregnant and bore a son, and she saw that he was exceedingly beautiful, and she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him, uh, took him uh, and, and made a, uh, an ark, a basket uh, made of, uh, of brushes or papyrus, making it watertight, dabbing it with lumen and pitch. And when she put the child in it and laid it, laid it in among the rushes on the brink of the river Nile, and his sister Miriam stood some distance away to learn what would be done to him. And now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river, and her maidens walked along the bank. And she saw the ark among the rushes, and she sent her maid to fetch it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby cried, and she took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. 
And then his sister ran and said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse of the Hebrew women to come and nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the girl went right away to her mom. And then Pharaoh's daughter, uh, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I'll give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him to the Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called him Moses, for, he, for she said, because he drew, drew him out of the water. You know, by all human standards, Moses never had a chance. Not only was he born to a slave, but there was already a death sentence upon his head. Had he been born a girl, he would have been allowed to live, but as a boy, he had no life expectancy. You know, as a Hebrew, he was born into this cruel culture of the ancient Egypt, where Pharaoh had decreed that all Hebrew boys would be born, were exterminated. Throw them in the river to the crocodiles. Thus Pharaoh became one of the long line of lunatics who had, who had attempted to exterminate the Jews. What caused this attempt to eradicate an entire race? You see, this is what Moses was born into. Perilous times. Times when there was racism and hatred. And yet because of a mother's love. Because of a mother's love a nation was changed. Her courage saved the nation. For her child Moses was the great deliverer of Egypt. Only, only eternity would show the greatness of this mother. Moses was her third child. First son was Aaron. He later became the high priest from his family and would become the priest of all priests. Her second child was Miriam. She looked after Moses. She immediately associated her with her brothers, uh, with her brothers in Israel's history. She was a gifted poet and musician as well. I think the story of Moses is one of the most beautiful and fascinating in the entire world. It is captivating. It keeps us on the edge of our seats. It's one of those stories that movies are made of. Once told, you never forget it. From the perspective of raising a child, Childbearing and child raising isn't for the timid or the faith, faint and hard. It's like turning the Indy 500 into an obstacle course with landmines. It's perilous. You know the direction you should head in and every intention of getting there. But all along the way, people throw things such, you, such as landmines and potholes and large objects to impede your journey. Uh, but once you've embarked, there's no turning back. Once you have kids, your life is over. That's why I tell young prospective couples, go slow. Make sure you've got it together between you before you take on kids. We were blessed. We waited, I think, almost 19 years before we had kids. And even then, wow. It doesn't prepare you for what you're, you're going to face. But once you have those little, little jewels, there's no turning back. They're yours. 